Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Green, and I want to welcome you to our church online worship experience. Today is first Sunday, so that means it's Communion Sunday. If you would like to partake in this time, be sure to have all of your elements, such as a small piece of bread, a cracker, and some juice. While you're getting that, I want to take this time to welcome all of our first time viewers. We are so grateful you're tuning in with us today, and we don't want this to be your last time. Don't be afraid to chat with us at any time during the service. If you need prayer, if you want to give, join this family, or accept Christ, our chat team is here for you. Today we're starting a new series called Unexpected Christmas with the message out of Luke 1, 26-38. These scriptures tell the second greatest story of all time. Of course, the greatest story of all time is Jesus dying on the cross for you and for me. But in this passage in Luke, it tells the second greatest story, the birth of Jesus and his arrival to earth. It was an unexpected surprise. You don't want to miss this series. All right, are you ready for communion? It is important that even though we are not physically together, that we worship together and we partake in worship together. And part of worship is communion. And in communion, we remember together. What do we remember? God's love for us, God's sacrifice for us, and God's gift for us. In a small room in Jerusalem, Jesus met with the disciples. He broke the bread and said, this is the new covenant of my body. And whenever you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. And they ate. Grab yours. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup represents my blood. And whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And they drank together. It is important for us to do this together as often as we can until we live with him again in heaven. Can I pray for us? Father, how we love you and how we honor you. Thank you for allowing us to commune with you, to fellowship with you, to talk with you. Lord, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice you made, for giving your love for us by showing it through your son, Jesus. Thank you for Jesus giving his body and his blood that we might not die to sin, that we might live eternally in heaven with him. Thank you for what you're going to do. We eagerly anticipate you sending Jesus to return for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, we're about to get ready to worship, but before we get to that, we want you to meet Carla. Every December, we end the year celebrating what God did in the areas of worship, grow, serve, and give. Carla's story is about how her life was changed through our online worship experience. Some of us, that's your testimony. We not only hope you are encouraged, but continue to be encouraged to give in this season. Take a moment to give now so that you can join us in fulfilling our mission and values that continue to change and impact lives in our direct community, our state, and around the world, just like Carla. My name is Carla Griffin, and I recently joined and accepted Christ. October the 11th, 2020. Leading up to the day that I decided to accept Christ, everything was hectic. Um, recently lost my father-in-law. Marriage seemed like it was all over the place. Children were all over the place. The world was all over the place. I just was trying to get an understanding of what was going on and able to balance it all out. Pastor Carter was in a sermon series called Fight, and he mentioned to me to anticipate the fight, activate my strength, and act like I've already won, and to stand on my victory. And that alone, and that service moved me to not only become a member, but to accept Christ again in my life so that he can carry me through. That stuck with me strong, and it's really helped me through, still helping me through. I came in kind of broken, but I did leave out whole. One of the main things when we initially got into the pandemic, Pastor Carter started speaking on self-care Sundays. I know we talk about it all the time, that God is always with us, the Spirit is with us, but I actually started, I felt it for myself, virtually. And it was surprising that you could connect that way without being actually in the midst of everything. Like you could feel the praise and worship when they were singing, it's like you felt it all, virtually. 
Even after church, I'll stay on. Even after the pastor has spoken, we've done everything. I'll stay on and just listen to the music that's being played. And then it carries over into my home. The kids will turn on the TV, they'll play card games, and we'll be listening to praise and worship. So it, it's carried, it carries over into the home. And it really sets your tone for that day, for the week. It's a self-starter. Worship has impacted me in 2020 by me taking a big step of my own of accepting Christ, bringing Christ into my home, letting him be the leader and the head of my family. And I'm looking forward to in 2021 to continue in this walk, this journey, and growing stronger in this faith and in Christ. Hallelujah. Come on, we celebrate our Lord, Emmanuel, the Christ, Almighty God, Prince of Peace. He's the counselor. We bless your wonderful name. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be today? We honor you today, Lord, and we thank you for another chance to give you glory. Oh, everybody say, tell them, come let us adore him. Come let us adore him. Yes, Lord. We honor your marvelous name. Yeah. Everybody come say. Come let us adore him.
worship you. We worship you, Lord. Great is your name. Mighty, mighty is your name. We call on you today as we celebrate this season of giving. We're still thankful for all that you're doing in our lives. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Yes, we do, Lord. Come on, clap your hands wherever you're sitting, right there. Hallelujah. You are the living word. You are, you are, you are. Your word is true. You're the truth. We use that word, that little phrase, like really funny, like you see the truth. No, God is the truth. And we thank you that you are God that cannot lie. Thank you, God, for saving our souls today. Mm. Yes, God. Bread of life, sin down from glory. Many things you wear on earth, a holy king, a comforter. You are the living word. Bread of heaven, set down for glory. Many things you wear on earth, a holy king, a carpenter. You are the living word, everybody. Bread of heaven, set down, set down from glory. Tell them, man. You are the living word. Bread of heaven. Sit down from glory. Oh, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, you are. Tell them you are the living word. Awesome ruler. You are a gentle redeemer. Living word, say awesome rule, gentle redeemer. Woo! Oh, yeah, the living and what a friend. We have a friend in our God. Tell him you are the living. Here we go. Say Jesus. That's what we call you. That's what.
You are our protector, mighty God. You are the living word. You are, you are, you are the living word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. Yes, God, today. Mm. Father, we come before you this morning in Jesus' name. We thank you for your son, Jesus. God, we praise your son, Jesus, as the living word. We do not serve a dead Savior. We do not serve a weak Savior. Serve a risen Savior, a strong Savior, a sovereign Savior, a royal Savior. Father, we're so grateful this morning. We thank you for this chance to worship you and honor you. God, we pray that throughout this season, your son Jesus will be honored and glorified in the name of our Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did they hear anything I said? Okay. Um, we are starting a new series today uh, called Unexpected Christmas, where we get to celebrate the work that God has, has done in his son Jesus. So we're excited to be doing that. Very grateful to Pastor Carter for the opportunity to preach this morning and excited to be able uh, to serve you. Uh, I'm, I'm sad that we haven't been able to gather in person. I haven't seen so many of y'all in a long time, but I'm grateful to be able to serve you from afar this morning. And we are going to be in Luke chapter 1. So I'm going to go ahead and read the text. Luke chapter 1. And I'll start reading at verse 26. This is what God's word says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. That's God's word. That's God's word. I want to talk to you this morning about an unexpected surprise. An unexpected surprise. Um, this, this is obviously a story that we are very familiar with, a story we've heard many, many times. Um, but I think one of the dangers with these stories is um, when we've heard them so many times, we can assume that we know everything about them. But they're so familiar that, that we don't even think about them that much anymore. So I'm praying that as, as we go through this, the Lord would help us to see it in a new way. Um, now, I want to start by saying this, that we, we often assume in our lives that whatever we see working out before our eyes is the way things are. We assume that whatever we see is the way things are. The things are what they seem. Maybe that's an easier way to say it. Um, and this is why sometimes we love gossip. Uh, because sometimes we think things are one way as we see them. This is why our culture loves celebrity gossip. Because sometimes you 
there's some famous couple that people see, I ain't gonna name no names, but then they learn there's some other stuff going on and people can't wait, they're pulling out popcorn because they're like, man, I thought it was something else and we're learning that some stuff is going on behind the curtain because we often assume that things are just how they seem. And sometimes we get some news, though, that changes the way that we see everything. This is especially true when it comes to our lives where we assume uh, that things are what they seem, you know, in a season right now where there may be a lot of things that are just not going our way. Um, you know, if, if things are as they seem, if this is the trajectory, I mean, you got COVID numbers going up and hospitalizations and deaths and unemployment and, and poverty, all of these things going in a bad direction. And we assume, well, this is what's in front of me. This is what I see. That must be the way that things are. But like I said, sometimes there's some new information or there's some news, some breaking news that breaks in and changes the way that we see everything. Here's an example for me. Um, a few years ago when I lived in Atlanta, there was a, a, a party that was going on. And my, my, one of my friends had invited me to. A lot of friends was in town. And so me and my wife dressed up. We're going to the party. And my wife is acting very strange um, this day. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready. And she is, let's say she's a very punctual person. And I'm trying to tell her, I'm like, hey, look, I know these people. We're going to be the first people there. You can relax. We're good. Um, she is really nervous and stressed. And she's texting people on the way there. And I can tell she's mad at me. And so I'm texting the counselor like, we're going to have to come in for a session on Tuesday. And it turns out when we get there, I walk in. The first thing that I hear is surprise. It is a surprise party for me. It is a birthday party for me. My wife had been lying to me for a whole month. She put this whole crazy thing together. But that was some news. It changed the way I saw everything else. I was able to text my counselor and be like, never mind. I think we're good. That was some news that changed the way that I, things weren't as they seemed. Sometimes there's news like that. That's the kind of news we have in this text, where there's some surprising news that breaks in and changes the way that we see things. And it doesn't just change it for the people in this story, for Mary and for Joseph. Uh, it also changes the way we should see everything now. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke so far, uh, the, the thing that we've just seen is that Mary's cousin Elizabeth is is pregnant, and, and we've seen an announcement to them about their son, John the Baptist, and the great things he'll do, and the way that they respond to that, and now we come to Mary. And as we go through this, we'll see that, you know, we'll often think, why would God do it that way? God's story is not the way that we would write it, because things often look different than how they turn out. Um, and, and if there's one thing I want you to walk away with, it's this, that what we see in this text, this good news, it changes everything. This good news Changes everything. The good news of Christmas. This is not just a, a time for cool, fun, and family. And it's not just something that changed things for them then or that changes things for me now um, or that changes things for us later. This good news in this text changes everything for us even right now. So we're going to look at three things uh, that God gives us good news about that changes everything for us. The first one is his favor. The first one is his favor, good news about his favor. Usually we think of um, favor as uh, approval, right? B being on somebody's good side. And that's something that we want, right? When I thought me and my wife was in a fight and it was a party, I, I, I wasn't feeling good. I like to be on my wife's good side. That's a safe place for me to be. And this is especially true if we're talking about someone who has any kind of influence or authority or, or power. We, we want to be on their good side. And usually people get in people's good graces, they get good favor because they've done good things, right? Maybe they've been someone who's been trustworthy. Maybe they've been someone who can do the job they've been asked to do. Well, Mary, of course, has this strange interaction where someone pops in and she's told she has the most important favor that there is to have. I'll read again. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. We, we are so familiar with this story that we can forget that Mary is just a regular young lady. Uh, there was nothing extraordinary about her to the human eye. She had friends like we do, right? She had family like we do. In fact, her cousin Elizabeth was just brought up in the chapter before, and he talks about her 
even right here. Um, she was a regular girl engaged to a regular dude named Joseph. And the way those engagements worked, it was like the first stage of the engagement, but they were, they were locked in, right? So, so th this news is strange. And they lived in, in Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Look, Nazareth was not Beverly Hills. It was not even Highland Park. We should think somewhere a little less fortunate. Not a place where you expect special people to come from. In fact, with Jesus, one of the ways people talk bad about Jesus is they said nothing good has ever come out of Nazareth. He can't be who they're saying that he is. This is not a place where you even expect special people to show up, but that's what's happened right here, is this angel shows up, sent by God to Nazareth. Not the place people are thinking God is sending angels. And Gabriel it seems to be one of those angels who has a special role. Seems like he's in God's presence a lot. We see some things that happen with, uh, with Gabriel in, in the book of Daniel. It's almost like God is sending one of his choice messengers to one of his favored servants to take a very important and radical message. And what does the angel say first? Greetings, you who are highly favored. Now, why would he call her highly favored? Because what we just saw is there's not a lot of special things about her. It's not because she was special and lived in a special place with special privileges, which shows us that God's favor is different than ours, right? God doesn't just favor the powerful or the popular. God's favor is unmerited. It is unearned. You don't get on God's good side by growing up in the right place or having the right resume. God gives freely because he's God. That's important for us to remember. Uh, I wonder if you think of yourself as favored by God. If, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, you should. But often when we think about having um, favor, Scripture says we're his favored ones. It's not because we're special, though, it's because we're his. And that should not make us arrogant. That should not make us proud um, because we understand that God's favor is charity. He's giving it away freely based on himself, not on us. And here's the thing about uh, favor is it's not to be hoarded. Right? It's not to be something to say, hey, look at all this favor I have. Scripture says the favor is something that can be shared. I wonder if you've ever thought about sharing the favor of God. The reason I say we can do that is because God welcomes everybody into his favor. Right? God is saying this is favor that I will give freely to anyone who's in Jesus. And so we get to say, let me share this favor with you. And, and Mary in this text is someone who's been favored by God based on his free gift. And, and remember, she is an ordinary young lady, which, which should help us see how unusual it is. Gabriel also says to her that the Lord is with her, which is a common encouragement to believers throughout the scriptures that the Lord is with you, that God is present. Not only is he present, but he's working on your behalf for your good and for his glory according to his plans. And that should give us confidence knowing that whatever's going on in our lives, God is with us in it. We may be isolated. We may be stuck at home by ourselves, but the Lord is with us. That should give us a special confidence. And, and though it's said to Mary here in a very special situation, this is something that could be said to all of us in whatever situation we're in. Hey, don't be afraid. The Lord is with you. You, you thinking me with, with the stuff I got going on? Yeah, the Lord is with you. And that should change the way that we go through things. That, that's part of the favor, the grace that God gives. Now, if this was the first time you ever heard this story, sh surely one of the things you're thinking to yourself is, what is Mary thinking right now? What is going through her mind? The text tells us. It says, she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this would be. Because um, imagine if you were just having a regular day and all of a sudden an angel popped up out of nowhere. I know we think that angels are very cuddly and cute, naked babies with wings. That's not in the Bible. I don't even know where we got that from. But whenever angels show up to people in Scripture, people are terrified. And I know the angel just told her the Lord is with you, which is comforting. But still, this, this is strange. It'd be like if somebody called you and was like, hey, first off, I just need you to know the cops are on their way. You'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's, what's, what's happening? I'm, I'm confused about what's about to come next. It says she was troubled and she wanted to know what kind of greeting this might be. But he says, don't be afraid. You found favor with God and he gives her the big news. 
Some of us would expect after saying you found favor with God that he says, now you can kick your feet up and enjoy that favor. That's not what he says. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. And we'll talk more about her conceiving and giving birth to a son, but I just want to point out one of our misunderstandings about the favor of God, that um, favor does not mean that we we just get to um, kick our feet up, that we just get to be served, that good things just come our way. Um, what, What actually happens is he says, you're favored, and now let me tell you about the privilege and responsibility that the Lord has given you. He's calling Mary to some serious work on his behalf. God is saying, I'm doing something amazing in the world to redeem the world, to make all things right. And Mary, I'm giving you the opportunity to be a part of that. I just want you to know if you consider yourself favored by God, I want you to know that God's favor demands something of us. God's favor doesn't tell us to sit back. It demands something of us. It's not something just to comfort us at the crib. It's something that we're supposed to uh, use to fuel us to serve others. And of course, this is what happens here where Mary's been called to serve others. She's surprised with some good news, and this good news changes everything for her, right? Her whole life has changed at this point, and it should do the same for us. The first was the good news about his favor. Uh, Second, number two, um, is the good news about his kingdom. Good news about his kingdom. Um, Verse 31 says this, you'll conceive and give birth to a son. You're to call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. What a unique pregnancy announcement. This is a little better than the one your cousin just did on Facebook. This is an angel coming to tell her about this. Um, And it's a very unique way to figure out that you're having a child. One unique thing for Mary here is she's not um, wondering what, whatever will come of this son of mine, which is something parents do. My wife and I just had our third child. He's, he's two months old, so if I look tired, that's why. Um, and one of the things that parents do with kids is you just wonder what they're going to be like, right? You're wondering what they change every day, so you're wondering what, what they're going to uh, look like, what they're going to be like. With mixed kids, you're always trying to figure out what is this hair texture finna do? There's all kind of stuff. There's more important things too, though, wondering what are they going to do with their lives, right? Where, where there'll be great things that they do in the world. And Mary doesn't have those kinds of questions because she's told immediately as she finds out she's having a child that not only will he be great, he'll be called the son of the most high. Not only will he be, uh, do something important in the world, he will be a king that reigns forever. And when we think of kings, this is not normally the origin story that we have in mind. Right? When we think kings, uh, we're thinking somebody born uh, to a royal family in a palace. That, that's not Jesus' backstory. He wasn't walking around with red capes on. The mother of Jesus wasn't being fed grapes by servants when she found out. And this is the surprising way that God goes about things. This, this is part of why this news changes everything. Because even people who are awaiting a king, this isn't how they thought He would come. When we think of Jesus as king, we should not make the mistake of just comparing him to earthly kings and thinking it's an exact comparison. Jesus is a king in a league of his own. For one, it says he'll be called the son of the most high, not the son of some other earthly king. This is not Henry the Ninth. This is not some dude. This is the son of the most high. It says he'll be given the throne of his father, uh, David. Jesus is a descendant of David. We, uh, many of us, if we know any Bible characters, we just know a few. David would be one of the ones that we know. David was this famous king uh, of Israel, and, and he was a songwriter, and he was a warrior, right? We, we know a lot about him. One of the promises that, that God made to his people in the Old Testament was that there would be a king um, th- that would be related to David down the family line, who would deliver Israel, who who would reign, who who would rescue them from their enemies, who would reign forever. Uh, Zechariah, um, uh, John the Baptist's dad, had just praised God for this when he found out that John the Baptist was going to be born because he says, God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And that horn of salvation language, back then they, they thought of a horn on an animal as its strength. 
uh, like an ox. And so that, that, that phrase, that the horn of salvation, was talking about this royal power or the power of a warrior. The God has sent a strong warrior that brings salvation. And as promised, it's in the house of David. He's, he's thinking God has sent this king to deliver us just as he said, which is why it says he'll reign over Jacob's descendants or, or the people of Israel. We know that Jesus is the king of the Jews, but we also know from Scripture that his reign goes a lot further than them, that Jesus will will reign over all things uh, for an eternity, that God has welcomed all of us. Isaiah 9, 7 says, Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You ever seen a video of somebody from like 20 years ago? And you're like, man, they sound the same. They, they may look a little different, but they're excited about the same stuff. Their voice sounds similar. They, they're still the same person. This is what it's like to read a prophecy like that in Isaiah 9, 7, that God the whole time has been promising, I'm sending um, someone to reign on David's throne who will reign forever, and God is doing exactly what he said. Scripture talks a lot about the, the kingdom of God and God's king, and Jesus tells us to pray that God's kingdom would come, and the reign of Jesus is different than the reign of most kings. We're not talking about him just reigning over a place. We're talking about his reign over all of creation. And, and that kingdom, though we're still praying for it to come perfectly to earth, begins in those who submit to Jesus. And here's how he's different as a king than most. Jesus is a humble king. When, when have you ever heard of a humble king? Kings uh, ain't out here trying to be humble because they don't have to. At least in their minds, Jesus was a humble king who came from humble means. Jesus is all about compassion, not trying to colonize, right? Je- Jesus is the king over other kings. And, and, and the reign of Jesus brings goodness and joy and prosperity and thriving wherever he goes, unlike most kings. Um, I wonder if you think of yourself and if you live like a citizen of God's kingdom. Would people know that, that we're citizens of God's kingdom? And do you see his reign in your life as a burden? You know, sometimes we treat Jesus like he's a king who's just a burden to us, the way that he's always calling us to submit to his ways, the ways that he's always calling us to turn away from things that don't please him, calling us to go in directions when we can't see it all. Now, I want you to know that the king that we serve is a king worth following. Um, and one of the other things that's unique about his reign is that it's forever. Again, it says he'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. You know, some good news, even good news that changes stuff, is temporary, right? Maybe good news, a good weather on a day, or your team is, is winning a game. Um, there's all kinds of good news that doesn't last very long. One of the greatest things about the kingdom of Jesus is that it, it will be forever, Y'all, we, we are used to leadership that comes and goes. Even people who've been in leadership a long time, one day they will die. But that's not the case with the reign of King Jesus. One of the most uh, popular shows on Netflix right now is called The Crown. It is a show about um, the royal family in England and all the drama that's happening. And I'm sure 90% of it's fake, but we would have no idea. But one of the things, at least on the show, that the royal family is always worried about with the scandals and the stuff that's happening around them is they don't want the, the monarchy to look bad. Because if it does, they're afraid that people will be like, why do we have a king and queen in the first place? Maybe we should just be like some of these other regular countries. Um, and they're afraid if there's too much scandal that the people will revolt against them. So they're always on edge trying to put up these appearances to make sure that they can stay in their place as this royal family. I just want you to know this is not an issue with Jesus. This is a word for other kings, worried to be pushed out or, or overthrown. It's different with King Jesus because nothing can outlast him. Nothing can overpower him. He is not a figurehead. He is the whole picture. He's the main idea. He's the first mover, and he is the sovereign king forever and ever. There is no king like King Jesus. And let me tell you, the fact that King Jesus reigns forever should change the way that we live right now. 
right? For one, um, sometimes um, we don't mind opposing somebody because we figure one day I may overcome them. We don't want to be on the side against King Jesus. We want to be on his side because his reign will be forever. For those of us who are already on his side, who've trusted in Jesus, we have a forever hope. Right? We can rest knowing that our king is in charge forever and that our king is good. So many times there's leadership that is corrupt, that lies, that just seeks to help themselves, that ignores what's going on in the world. We have a king who has our needs in mind, who rules with dignity and integrity, who leads by example, who knows all things. And, and we, of all people, should long for the day when Heaven comes to earth and his kingdom comes and everything is on earth as it is in heaven. This, this is good news. It changes everything, not just for the people right here, but also for us. The, the, the third final thing that, that God shares with us here that, and the good news that changes everything for us is his promise-keeping power. So his favor, his kingdom, and third, his promise-keeping power. We, we finally get to hear from Mary at this next part in the text. She finally is going to speak and respond to this. She just got a whole lot of news at once. Just hearing that you're about to have a baby, that's, that's plenty of news by itself. But obviously there's a lot more than just that. And the way that she responds is she just asks, how? She just says, how? how? I don't understand. How, how is this going to happen? She doesn't respond with doubt like Zechariah did, John the Baptist's dad, in the chapter before where... Um, you know, he responds with doubt, and then he, his mouth is shut uh, during the pregnancy. That, that's not what happens. Um, she responds uh, with faith, and, and she just wants to know how. Again, verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. One of the reasons Mary has how is because she's just not sure. She's not married, right? And there's no flings that this that could have led to some pregnancy. So it seems like a pretty natural question to ask. And he says, basically, because God is going to do it. I understand it seems impossible to you. This isn't the natural, normal way to conceive a child. But he says the, the power of God will overshadow you um, and, and the Holy Spirit will work and do it which is a good answer to many things that we wonder how possibly they could work out because God is going to do it, right? Because God has power that we don't have. We should not think that God is limited like we are. No limitation of yours has the same limiting power on God. Um, this is almost like sometimes I'll see, me, me, I watch uh, America's Funniest Home videos with my kids, and one of the things that will happen is, They'll put together like some montage of uh, people trying to like carry their wives or their girlfriends at a wedding. And you can tell immediately that it's not going to go how they thought it was, especially when it's a dude that's like 5'1 and she's 5'11. You're just like, this is not about to go well. This is heavier than he thought. Well, I just want you to know that this is not how it works with God. No matter what the load is, God is not worried about, wait, 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 but am I strong enough to carry this weight? This changes my ability to do it. Whatever limitations you have, whatever burdens you have, whatever kind of things to think, no, 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 this makes it heavy and difficult for this thing to work out. Those limitations do not apply to God. He can carry any load with ease. Sometimes we think it's humble to doubt if things will work out. But, but that's not saying something about you. You're saying something about God, that he's limited like you are, and he just is not. God can bring his son into the world through a virgin, and he does it here. And here's why it matters that he does. One is they said he would in prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14 says the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. Right? It also shows there's something unique about Jesus. This is not a regular dude. It makes clear that he is the son of God. Not just Mary's son, he's also the son of God. Joseph would be his earthly, his earthly father, but his real father is God himself. And here's something very kind that, that God does through this angel is he tells her about Elizabeth. Right? So just in case she's still not sure how this could happen, here's what the, the angel says. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail, right? He's basically saying, I know it was hard to believe 
Um, but let me encourage you with some good news that God has already done, right? Mary wouldn't expect to be pregnant, neither would Elizabeth, for completely different reasons. But God can bring it to pass. Elizabeth was old. She was said to be barren, unable to have children. And the angel says, not only has God done this before, he's done it in your family just now. You have reason to believe. There's nothing impossible for God, so no word that he says fails. You know how sometimes you might have friends who have good intentions, but they don't ever follow through? Where, you know, they're not trying to lie to you, but you know that when they said um, they're going to come over to your house and help you put that table together, you're like, okay, sure, Th- thanks for that. Or, or when somebody says, oh, let's get together next week, you're like, okay, yeah, sure. And you know they have good intentions, but they're probably not going to follow through. Um, there's something wonderful about a Savior and a King um, who is both willing and able, who, who does everything he said, who doesn't just have good intentions. He is unique And that every intention that Jesus has is exactly how it goes. Every intention that God has is what happens. This is why his word never comes back void, right? He is a promise-keeping God. In the chapter before, Zechariah is rejoicing. He says, just as he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets. That's the kind of God we have. We have a just as he spoke kind of God. When God promised to send his wonderful counsel and prince of peace, he did. God keeps his promises. He's a just how he spoke kind of God, not a kind of like he said kind of God. He's a a promise-keeping kind of God, not a promise-breaking kind of God. He always does precisely what he said he would do, and it's this God who surprises us with this good news that changes everything. And here's why it matters that God is a promise-keeper, because at the center of any relationship is trust. So just like if, if, if somebody doesn't do what they said, it breaks trust, it should work the other way around, um, that the opposite should be true. When someone always does what they say, it should lead to trust. Their words carry weight. And that should definitely be true for the one who has absolutely never broken a promise. We doubt his promises sometimes. Um, I wonder what promises of God you feel tempted to doubt today. I wonder if you feel tempted to doubt that that God will never leave you or if you feel tempted to doubt that God will provide for you uh, or you feel tempted to doubt that God has provided every spiritual blessing in Jesus so that um, he'll keep you. I wonder if you feel tempted to doubt that he's strong when we're weak. Well, I just want you to know the greatest way to fight doubt in God's promises is to remind yourself that he's kept every single promise that he's ever made. Sometimes we got to remember that God is playing the long game, right? Things are not always as they seem, like we said. You ever um, thought about somebody and wondered what they were doing in that moment? Usually we do this with somebody we like. We're like, man, I wonder what she's doing right now. Well, if we um, are ever wondering what God is doing at the moment, I want you to know that God is busy keeping his promises. We we may not see exactly how he's going to do it, but what is God doing right now? He is at work keeping his promises. This thing that seems like it's in the way of God's promises, I just want you to know, God is at work keeping his promises. Somehow, he's at work keeping his promises, and that matters. And we won't always know exactly how he's going to do it. So so I'm just going to say, if if your peace depends on you always knowing not only that God will keep his promises, but exactly how, then you are setting yourself up for failure because God often does things in ways that we, uh, we don't see. And it, it's the exception when we know exactly how he's going to do it. So like we said, you know, this is a lot of news for Mary, right? God is going to do this. And, and this is how Mary responds to, to all of this. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary responds with faith and submission to God, right? She she knows that this could be catastrophic for her, that this could lead to divorce. Scripture says that Joseph thought about how to put her away quietly, that this could mean her being disowned. This could mean her being all alone. And yet the only thing that she says is, I'm your servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She understands that she's here to serve God, and she has a willingness to do it. And that's how we should serve. We should follow her lead in that. I do want to say this, that um, 
as we've seen in sex, things are not always as they seem. And this good news about Jesus changes everything. And, and here's part of how that speaks to us right now is we're in situations that may seem really hopeless, some of us. Again, there's a trajectory of where things are going that doesn't look good. 2020 has been devastating for a lot of us. And, and, if, and if the way that we decide if things are going to be okay is just looking around and seeing how things work out in front of us, we will be hopeless. But, but I just want to say this, the good news about Jesus changes everything. And we have a forever king that we can hope in, right? So, yes, you know, there are people around us who are getting sick and suffering. Some of us are doing it ourselves. But Jesus, the forever king, was born, and that means we can have hope. And so I don't know where my next meal is coming from, and, and that is a very tough situation. And God knows, and God sees, and God is with you. But I also want you to know that you can have hope because the forever king came into the world. And I know there may be some difficulties in your marriage and in your relationships. The forever king came into the world so you can have hope. There's good news about Jesus that, that changes it all. And, and here's how I want to challenge you in light of that. Here, here, here's your challenge for this week. That this hope that we've been given in Jesus, I want you to share it with others. So all the situations going on around you, we want to be more like the angel Gabriel who, who's saying, don't be afraid the Lord is with you. Who's saying, let me remind you of God's faithfulness in the life of Elizabeth. We want to be those people to bring hope and light to situations, not more darkness and despair. I want you to find ways this week uh, to take that hope and bring it to the situations around you because this good news does change everything. And things aren't always as they seem. Sports teams know this. You ever see at halftime a team, even if they are by 90 points, the reporter says, how do you feel about this? They say, it's a lot of time left on the clock. I don't want to get ahead of myself. And as things look hopeless to us, my prayer is that we'll say, no, no, not only is there a lot of time left on the clock, but I know exactly how this game ends. And so I can have hope even in the midst of this because I know the good news that changes everything. Let me pray. Father, we, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you so much for this good news about Jesus. We thank you for sending your son into the world. Father, we even thank you for laying out this story about how it happened. Thank you for showing us your favor, God, and your kingdom, Father. Thank you so much for showing us the ways that you work to keep your promises by your great power. And, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to live in light of it. Thank you for your son. Father, we pray now that you would give us grace to trust you, to follow you, to love you. God, I pray for those who don't know you that you'd help them to come to know you. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I know that uh, there may be some people who are watching right now who are enjoying hearing about Jesus. Maybe you've never thought very deeply about Jesus and, and you don't know. Or maybe you're just not sure if you have an actual relationship with Jesus. Well, part of this good news that's shared is that this baby went on to lay his life down for sinners and rise from the grave. And that favor that God gives freely can be yours. Um, right now, during this time of, of invitation, you should see on the screen or in the chat ways that we can connect with you and, and, and you can accept Jesus as your Savior. You can turn from your sins. You can trust in Jesus. We love to talk to you about that and help you to begin your journey following the Lord Jesus. Also, there's opportunities for you to connect with us as a church, Concord. We love serving our community. We love serving each other. We love walking with each other in groups. Whatever your next step is in the life of this church, um, we would love to help connect you. So again, there should be links on the screen or in the chat to help you to figure out how you can connect further. And, and if you are someone who's saying today, I am putting my faith in Jesus. I want to follow him. We want to welcome you uh, to the family, and then we would love to walk alongside you. Um, one of the ways that, that we respond to what God has done is by giving back to him some of what he has given to us. We, we as a church 
have sought to use every ounce of what God has given us to serve God and to serve our community and to serve uh, the people that God has put in our care. And so uh, I I, want to give you an opportunity to give. Again, on the screen, um, it should be showing you right now that there are three ways to give. You can give on the website, uh, you can give by text, and you can give by mail and checks, and it should show you right there. And, and I just want you to know that there's so many things that your faithful giving has enabled us to do as a church that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. This is teamwork. So we praise God for the ways that you've been faithful and giving. And, and we wanted to give you that opportunity to continue worshiping God through giving. And what I want to do right now is pray that the Lord would help us to use what he's given us for his work. Father, we we come before you again in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for everything you've placed into our hands. We thank you for every opportunity, every talent, every dollar, God. And we pray that you would help us as a church to use those dollars for your glory. Thank you for the work that you've already brought about. We cannot wait to see the work that you continue to do. We ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. word from Pastor Tripp. Listen, he encouraged us, but he also challenged us to find hope in every situation. Don't look for drama. Don't look for despair, but find hope. I don't know about you, but that was a word for me. So this week, the challenge is that you find hope in every situation. Listen, if you accepted Christ for the very first time or joined our church, we want to welcome you to our family. Welcome. We're so excited for you in this new step that you've taken. Someone from our team will follow up with you for more information. Hey friends, we want you to save the date, December 31st, New Year's Eve for Revive. We have some really exciting things that will happen that night and we can't wait for you to be a part. There's more information of Revive to come. And speaking of Revive, we're doing a prayer challenge. Listen, we've been through a lot this year and we wanna end this year with prayer. So our prayer challenge is, there's a link they're going to drop in the chat. You can go on our website, www.concorddallas.org, and then go to the challenge. And we want you to fill out a form, three emphasis on prayer. One, we want you to lament over the things that you've lost. Lamentations talks about casting our cares and God showing us compassion and mercy. Tell God all about the things you've lost this year. Grieve over those. Then second, we want to thank God. God for his faithfulness. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of an epidemic, in the midst of all that's going on, God has still been faithful to us. And then last, the third one we want you to focus on is celebrating what God is going to do, how he's going to fulfill his promises, how he's going to make good on his word. So three things, lament over what you've lost, thank God for his faithfulness, and then asking him what, asking him for what you want and what you need. Listen, I know this year has been a little crazy. Let's take some time to get in the holiday mood. Our worship team is coming, and they're going to send a little cheer from God's house to your house. Go ahead. Grab some hot cocoa. Grab you some coffee. Grab your favorite blanket, your puppy, your family, whatever you need. Get them around. Let's begin celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you again for tuning in and worshiping with us today. We know we'll see you next Sunday, same time, same place. God bless you. More today. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is a night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appears and the soul felt this world. A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks The new and glorious morn